as a, as a former school principal, I, I would maybe start by noting, if you're gonna get sent to the principal's office, you really ought to be the son of the board chair. <laughs> it, 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 it works out in your favor. Um, the, 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 the space where I work that uses the word pluralism with a great deal of regularity and absolutely no consensus is, is the Jewish day school. So when we speak about pluralistic Jewish day schools, when someone says, well, what is that? We say it's the place where everyone is equally dissatisfied. <laughs> and something that, that, that I'm going to sort of talk about for a minute is that sort of place about that sort of dissatisfaction and learning to live with it. So my opening hypothesis is that we usually don't mean pluralism when we say pluralism. We often mean something else, but we use the word pluralistic because the plural, word pluralism gets at what we don't really want to say, which is we can get really close, but we're never going to get there, so we better not have a clear definition of getting there, so no one can ever hold our feet to the fire for not being there when we say we will be. Um, from, the story that I want to tell is a little bit different. I actually want you to kind of tell the story with me, okay? And I want you to tell the story with me in the following way. Go back in your own mind's eye 20 years. And in your own mind's eye going back 20 years, imagine getting in an elevator in a very tall building. You enter at the lobby, and just as the doors are closing, one other person gets in the elevator with you. The door closes. You've each pressed your buttons, and something happens in the silence very quickly you somehow into it that you are in the elevator with another Jew. Your Judar goes off, right? You get a beep, and by the time you've reached the first person's floor, you have learned this person's Jewish narrative. Because they said things to you like conservative, Hadassah, B'nai B'rith, Hillel, Reform, okay, Israel, and they used certain words, and they didn't use other words, and those few words they chose to use in the elevator journey told you what you needed to know, and you did the same thing for that person's benefit, and you, that person gets off the elevator, and you say, ah, Lanzman, right, followed you. Jump ahead to today, get on that same elevator, and as the same thing, the door's closing, someone else jumps in, you each press your button, and in the silence, well, something else happens. Your Judar may not go off so quickly because we have become a physically, a visually more diverse community than we were 20 years ago for all kinds of reasons or in all kinds of ways. But somehow you get into the Jewish conversation and when the door opens on that person's floor, you have to put your hand in front of the censor because those words aren't what people are going to say. They're going to say, Shomer Shabbos eats dairy out. They're going to say, belongs to Temple Torah, goes to Chabad, parks around the corner, <laughs> right? I go to the Hashkama Minyan, my wife goes to a feminist drum circle, and we pick our kids up at the Y <laughs> from their Torah basketball yoga group, right? And it's very hard at the end of that journey to quickly say Lanzman again, because what we really find ourselves in is this place where the Jewish collective identity is in absolute contrast with the Jewish individual identity. Right? We think of it, America has been in a conversation about the rugged individual, the individualist, for whom they always have to have this pluralistic setting. That hasn't been the Jewish conversation for a couple thousand years. It's been, there have been ways to be Jewish. Some people would say way to be Jewish. And you're at some proximal distance from that way or ways, and that's for what we're striving. But now we're looking at something very different. So we have these paradigms in which everyone is on these different elevator journeys. And when we get off the elevator, for me, the question about, the, about sort of the story of pluralism is, pluralism is, when that person gets off the elevator, do you say Lanzman? Or do you say, you know, not Jewish enough, too Jewish? weirdly Jewish, not exactly Jewish, close to Jewish. Where, where do we land in our own real sense of the other person's Jewish experience in direct value opposition to our own? And that's what I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about more today in the panel and invite you to do so with me. So uh, I work at Hillel, and in many ways I think Hillel is the place uh, where pluralism lives. It, it is the kind of foundational DNA of what we do, and sometimes we actually take it for granted. 
Uh, and I actually just want to tell three stories. Uh, again, they don't in any way answer the question, but I think it lays out two, two stories that are maybe indicative of the kind of pluralistic struggles that we have, and one that may be slightly off the radar, but I think is important to bring into the conversation. Uh, the first story is a story about an Orthodox kid who grew up in Cleveland. His name's John. He went to Penn, and he took a gap year, studied in yeshiva, and his first experience with Hillel his freshman year was during the Hillel barbecue. And we had a band playing, and all of a sudden, uh, the male lead singer of the band swapped out with a female lead singer. And this guy had just gotten back from a year from, at the Gush. And he heard a woman singing, which his rabbis had told him in no uncertain terms was prohibited for him to hear. And he ran over to me as the associate director of Hillel and said, we can't have a woman's voice, we can't have Koli Shah, we can't have a woman's voice singing at a Hillel barbecue. Otherwise, I can't be here. Sophomore year of college uh, was Hurricane Katrina. And John got involved in an interfaith response to Hurricane Katrina, and he was perplexed at the big event that was going to happen on campus. There was going to be a female singer reciting verses from the New Testament, and uh, an Islamic uh, pers student reading verses out of the Quran which his rabbi had told him both of these actually count as prayer. And as an Orthodox Jew, he wasn't allowed to pray with people of different religions. So John struggled with this, and when he came out, he very, in a very menschy way stepped out um, of, the, of the service for those two parts and stepped back in for the rest of it. His senior year, he went with us to Limud, New York. He woke up, sh up Shabbos morning, and he went to hear a Debbie Friedman Shabbat morning service. So John is still an Orthodox Jew. He's married, he has kids, he's, his frum kite is fully intact, yet he got to a place by the end of his senior year of college where he could get up Shabbos morning, daven in his hotel room, and then go to a Debbie Friedman concert. And he was not troubled by Debbie Friedman's sexual orientation or the guitar on Shabbos or the content of her words. He was able to dwell in someone else's Jewish space without having to feel like it fulfilled his obligation to pray, but in a way that it didn't tarnish him by being in that space. So this, I think, is an amazing example of what a pluralistic experience can do to somebody. The second story I want to tell you about a Penn student also ends up at Limud. There was a woman named Sarah who grew up in Los Angeles. Now, from what I hear, there are Jews in Los Angeles, yet she managed to go through 18 years of it and never met a single Jew when she was there. All the things that American Jews do, Sarah did not do. She didn't light Hanukkah candles growing up. She didn't attend Passover seders. There may have been a night here or there where she lit Hanukkah candles. But all of these things that even kind of the most far out American Jews somehow partake in, she was still out of that. Uh, and she went on birthright. We got to know each other. And then she joined this program that we run called the Jewish Renaissance Project. And she fell in love with Judaism. And she was being totally turned on to Jewish values and a Jewish sense of how to spend time and a Jewish sense of appreciation in the world. And she said, I want to go to Limud. And I said, Sarah, are you, are you ready for this? And, and, one of, and I love the Limud. I'm not trashing the Limud New York conference. But one of, their, um, the, one of their talking points is that it's Jews of every stripe. So we go, and Sarah's there. And Saturday night, she's bawling her eyes out. And I say, Sarah, what's going on? And she says, I don't understand anything that's happening. And I said, oh, is it the Hebrew? Is there too much text? She says, no, no, everything's translated. I, I don't understand the way people are dressed. Why does everyone pretend like they know me and they can just come up and talk to me? Everyone here like, pretends like they're old friends. This is your example, Mark, of meeting somebody in the elevator and your judar goes off. What do you do about a Jewish person who feels deeply Jewish, who is excited about growing into a deeper Jewish identity, and when you put them in a Jewish kind of, I don't know, Ashkenazic cultural context, it's not even that their judar doesn't go off. They're turned off. I mean, she was a sophomore in college. She basically said, like, these people all dress badly. And if this is what Judaism is, if I have to grow up and become them, I don't want to be Jewish. I want to light Shabbos candles. I want to observe some kind of food stuff because I, like, I dig the values, but I don't need to become one of these people. And so as we start to imagine pluralism, when I look at a college campus, what I see is that pluralism basically tends to deal with the 15% of American Jews who are very comfortable in an institutional Jewish context. Day school, camp, uh, speaking Yiddish, uh, involved in Federation stuff, connected to the state of Israel. But for the other 85% of American Jews, who are not just post-denominational, but are post-institutional, uh, there are major questions, I think, still about what the future of pluralism looks like. And the last story I want to share with you, and this is a type of pluralism which we haven't mentioned yet, but I think is actually 
where it's most kind of visceral for people, at least what I see in the Jewish community, and that's around Israel. So I had a Jewish student walk into my office uh, last year and say, I'm interested in bringing the International Conference of Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction activists and academics to Penn. I'd like you to speak at the conference, and I'd like Hillel to be a co-sponsor. I, there's not much more to say than that, right? <laughs> um, the three students who, this is caught a lot of national media last year, there was a very large gathering on Penn's campus, uh, very visible, and two of the three students who were leading this charge were Jewish. I, sh I shouldn't say that, actually. One was in the process of converting to Judaism. And so this question of who's in and who's out, it was so clear that I had to say no. And also there were sub-levels where we had to manage a coalition of students from you know, the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, which is very right-wing, to J Street U, which is, I don't know, left-wing or center-left, depending on where you sit, um, to manage that coalition to come up with a response to a boycott conference. And these boundaries of Israel keep getting harder and harder. So OK, boycott out of the tent. What about boycotting of products that are grown and developed in the West Bank? Is that in the tent or out of the tent? Jewish Voices for Peace is that group. Or one of the things that's happening right now on Penn's campus is a conversation about uh, breaking the silence. So Breaking the Silence as an organization doesn't advocate boycott, but many of their speakers have gone off script and said, while the organization doesn't say this, I personally really think that Zionism is racism. So, and there are many, many Jews on campus now who feel like their Zionism says, I must boycott stuff, you know, wines produced in occupied territory or products like uh, the soda machines that are developed in the West Bank. So just questions, no answers.